Hello everybody and welcome to our fifth video lecture. Today we'll explore some ways that we can use change of variables to simplify some integrals. At the same time we'll also discuss integrals and change of variables with three dimensions. To start out let's consider the problem of calculating the following integral. The double integral over r of x plus 2y dA where here r is the parallelogram with vertices minus 1, 3, 1 minus 3, 3 minus 1, and 1, 5. If I just draw a picture of the domain that I'm integrating over in the xy plane, I'm going to see right away that the setup of doing this straightforwardly, you know, just with our usual methods for integrating things over general regions in the xy plane, is going to be kind of complicated. At the bare minimum, I would have to break up my double integral into two separate double integrals, dividing the domain of integration into two different domains of integration, which I'm splitting by a red line here. That seems like a lot of work, so instead what we're going to do is we're going to use a change of variable to make this complicated looking blue region into a much simpler region. In fact, if we choose our change of variables just right, we can make it so that the corresponding transformation is going to take a rectangle to our parallelogram. We can do that in this case with something called an affine transformation. To define our transformation, t Remember that this is the same thing as setting x equal to some function of u and v and y equal to some function of u and v. An affine transformation is a specific version of this where we don't have any x squared terms or y squared terms or, or sorry, u squared terms or v squared terms or uv terms, just linear terms. So x is some constant times u plus some constant times v plus some other constant and y is some constant times u, plus some constant times v, plus some other constant. And if I choose these constants just right, I can make this 1 by 1 square here in the uv plane map to the corresponding parallelogram. If that's the case, well then it has to take the point, say, 0, 0 over to one of the, one of the vertices in the parallelogram too. And let's just go ahead and pick one arbitrarily. So t should map 0, 0 to the point 1, minus 3. Then where can t send the point 1, 0? It can't send it to this point here, because that wouldn't make any sense. In particular, we'd expect it to go one to one of the vertices, which is actually joining this vertex here, so either this one or this one, because it's coming from something having that same property. So I need to choose either to send it to this one or to this one. And let's just go ahead and make it simple and send it to this guy right here, preserving the orientation of everything. So t of 1, 0 should be sent to the point 3 minus 1. Similarly, we find that t of 0, 1 should get sent to the point 1, 3. Or excuse me, minus 1, 3. And finally, t of 1, 1 should be sent to the remaining vertex, which is 1, 5. So I've got these different constraints, and these different constraints here, that is the expected behavior of t, is going to help me figure out what I need to take for a, b, r, c, d, and s. For example, if I use the very first constraint, this is going to say that 1 should be equal to 0 times u, excuse me, uh, a times 0 plus b times 0 plus r and that minus 3 should be equal to c times 0 plus d times 0 plus s. I'm just plugging in 0 and 0 in for u and v and 1 in for x and minus 3 in for y. So this automatically tells us what r and s have to be. r has to be 1 and s has to be minus 3. So we've already solved for two of our constants right out the bat. If I use the next constraint, I find that 3 has to be a times 1 plus b times 0 plus r, and minus 1 has to be c times 1 plus b times 0 plus s. And since I already know what r and s have to be, let's just go ahead and sub those in too. So this tells me right away that a has to be equal to 2, and b has to be, or sorry, a c has to be equal to. 2 also. 
And finally, if we use another constraint, say the third constraint there that says that t of 0, 1 is minus 1, 3, we find that minus 1 is equal to a times 0 plus b times 1 plus r, and 3 is equal to c times 0 plus d times 1 plus s. Again, we already know what r and s are, so we can substitute those in. And this leads us right away to the result that b is equal to minus 2 and d is equal to 6. So the transformation, which takes my 0, 1 by 0, 1 square into the appropriate parallelogram, is exactly the transformation with these coordinates. t is this map here, which sends x to 2u minus 2v plus 1 and sends y to 2u plus 6v minus 3. So this is our transformation. And now in order to do the integral, I'm going to need one more ingredient, which is the Jacobian. The Jacobian is the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives. First I'm taking the partial derivative of x with respect to u, getting a 2, and then I'm getting the partial derivative of x with respect to v, getting a minus 2. Next, I'm putting in the partial derivative of y with respect to u, getting a 2, and following it up with the partial derivative of y with respect to v, getting a 6. So the determinant of this, of this matrix is going to be 16, and that'll be useful for actually calculating the integral. So the integral, then, that we were trying to do at the get-go was the double integral over r of x plus 2y dA. And now by a change of variables, I can write this as the double integral over s, where s here is this square that we were mapping to. So in our picture here, this is s, this is r, and I can rewrite this as the integral over s of x, but rewritten in terms of u and v is going to be 2u minus 2v plus 1 plus 2y which is going to be 2 times 2u plus 6v minus 3. And it's du dv. And now since s is a square, writing down the integral there is very easy. This is just the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to 1, of this quantity, which I can also simplify much, much further. I can rewrite this as 6u plus 10v minus 5 du dv and this is a very easy integral to do at this point this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of 3u squared plus 10uv minus 5u evaluated from 0 to 1 dv which is just going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of 10v minus 2 dv which is just 3 so we can see there that finding the appropriate change of coordinates really simplified our work quite a bit. And this is something that we can always do for parallelograms. Any parallelogram can be mapped to from a square. Indeed, it can be mapped to from a one by one square. And the process of figuring out which map is the right one goes just like how we did. Now, of course, a lot of things are not parallelograms, but changing variables can still be useful for these more complicated objects. For example, let's think about doing the double integral over r of x squared dA, where r here is the region inside the ellipse x squared minus xy plus y squared equals 2. The region that we're integrating over looks something like this. Intuitively, we might suspect that if we choose just the right change of coordinates, we'll be able to get this region by mapping something very nice, say a circle. This would be a definitive advantage because integrating over circles is a lot easy, especially when we use tools like polar coordinates. To see which transformation does this for us, we're going to rewrite our original expression in a suggestive way. In particular, we can notice by completing the square, we can rewrite the expression as 1 half the quantity x minus y squared plus 1 half y squared. Or, if we multiply through by a factor of 2, we just get the quantity x minus y squared 
plus y squared equals 4. This suggests if I just define x minus y to be u, and v to be y, then in terms of u and v, the old equation will become u squared plus v squared equals 4, which is definitely a circle of radius 2 in the uv plane. So this seems like the right move to do. But the difference here is I'm defining what u and v are in terms of x and y instead of the other way around. So what I'm doing with this is I'm defining t inverse. And to actually get t, I need to solve our equations for u and v into equations in terms of x and y. y is already solved for, so that second equation is very easy. It just says that y is equal to v. And if I put that into the first equation, I get u equals x minus v. So x is going to be equal to u plus v. So this defines our transformation t going from the uv plane to the xy plane. And it takes our circle of radius 2 into our ellipse. Using this, we should also calculate the Jacobian, j of uv, which is going to be the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix of partial derivatives. First we input the partial derivative x with respect to u, which is 1. Following this, it's the partial derivative x with respect to v, which is also 1, partial derivative of y with respect to u, which is 0, and then the partial derivative of y with respect to v, which is 1. And the determinant of this expression is just 1 again. So this means that the double integral over our rectangle r, or sorry, not rectangle, but region r, which in this case was this ellip ellipse region here, is equal to the same double integral but over s in terms of our new variables. So I was integrating before the double integral over r of x squared dA, and this is now going to become the double integral over s of what x is in terms of u and v, which is u plus v squared du dv. Now this is integrating over a circle, so it makes sense to do this in terms of polar coordinates. Rewriting this as an integral in polar coordinates, this becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And then integral from 0 to 2 of some expression times r d r d theta. And here we're remembering that for polar coordinates, x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. But there's a difference here too. I'm converting from polar coordinates from the uv plane. So for us here, u is equal to r cosine theta and v is equal to r sine theta. So the term that we're integrating inside this parentheses here is going to be r cosine theta plus r sine theta. And that was getting squared times r d r d theta. So this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi and the integral from 0 to 2 of cosine theta plus sine theta, the quantity squared, times r cubed times dr d theta. To make this integral easier, we can rewrite that squared term using some trig identities as the integral from 0 to 2 pi and the integral from 0 to 2 of 2 sine theta cosine theta plus 1, the quantity times r cubed dr d theta. That innermost integral gives us the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the quantity 2 sine theta cosine theta plus 1 times 1 fourth r to the fourth evaluated from 0 to 2. This is just going to be the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the quantity 2 sine theta cosine theta plus 1 times 4 d theta. Integrating this, we end up with 4 times the quantity sine squared plus 1 evaluated from 0 to 2 pi, which is exactly 8 pi. Oh, and I have a bit of a typo here. When I did that last integral, it should have been sine squared theta plus 1, it should have been sine squared theta plus theta, and that gives us our 8 pi there. 
Let's do another example. In this example, I want to calculate the double integral over r of e to the x plus y dA, where here r is a set of all x, y values, so the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y is at most 1. In the x, y plane, the region r here is a diamond shape, where here this is 1 and 1, and this is minus 1, and this is minus 1. A diamond shape, in particular, is a parallelogram, so I know I can get the same region by choosing, again, some sort of affine transformation from the uv plane to the xy plane in such a way that it maps the square with side lengths 1 and 1 into my region r. In fact, one might notice that all of the examples that we've gone through so far are exactly involving these affine transformations. So affine transformations themselves are doing a lot of really good work for us. Now if we remember here, an affine transformation t sends an x to ax, or sorry, au, plus bv, plus some constant r, and sends y to cu, plus dv, plus some constant s. And we need to start out by sending the origin somewhere, and we can just pick any of these points here. So let's go ahead in this case, we'll send our origin to this point here, which is the point minus 1, 0. So we write that down as t of 0, 0 has to be the point minus 1, 0. Then it makes sense to send t, uh, send the point 1, 0 to this point over here. So t of 1, 0 is going to be mapped to the point 0, minus 1. And then finally, I should map t of 0, 1 to the point 0, 1. This says t of 0, 1 is 0, 1. And then for the last corner 2, we have a fourth condition, which we won't actually need to use in our calculation of the coefficients. But we'll write it down anyway. And it says that t of 1, 1 should go to that final point there, which was the point 1, 0. So we're going to use these criteria in order to figure out my coefficients a, b, r, and c, d, s, r. The very first one says that minus 1 is going to be equal to a times 0 plus b times 0 plus r, and that 0 is going to be equal to a times 0, sorry, not a, but c times 0, plus d times 0, plus s. So right away this tells us that r is equal to minus 1, and s is equal to 0. Using our second condition, we end up with 0 equals a times 1 plus b times 0 plus r. And we get, as well, minus 1 is equal to c times 1 plus d times 0 plus s. And if I use the fact that I know that my value of r is minus 1 and my value of s is 0, This tells me that a is equal to 1, and c is equal to minus 1. Finally, if I apply that third condition there, this is going to tell me that 0 is equal to a times 0 plus b times 1 plus r, and that 1 is equal to c times 0 plus d times 1 plus s. And again, we're going to use the fact that we know r and s. And this tells us right away b is equal to 1 and d is equal to 1. 
So let's solve for all of my coefficients. So the transformation that I actually want here is the transformation t, which sends x to u plus v minus 1, and sends y to minus u plus v. And then the determinant of this, sorry, the Jacobian of this transformation is the determinant of the matrix of first partial derivatives. So it's the partial derivative of x with respect to u, which is 1, the partial derivative of x with respect to v, which is 1, partial derivative of y with respect to u, which is minus 1, and the partial derivative of y with respect to v, which is 1. So this determinant is going to be 2. And then that tells us that the double integral over r of e to the x plus y dA is going to be the same thing as the double integral over that square s of e to the x, which is u plus v plus 1, or sorry, my, u plus v minus 1, plus y, which is minus u plus v du dv. This is the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to 1, of e to the 2v minus 1 du dv. The first integral just gives us 1, so this just gives us the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the 2v minus 1 dv, which is just 1 half e to the 2v minus 1 evaluated from 0 to 1, which is 1 half of e minus e to the negative 1. We can also do change of variable in three dimensions. For three dimension, I'm thinking of, of a transformation t from the uvw space into xyz space. And it takes some sort of solid region s into some other solid region r. In this case, I can rewrite an integral over r as an integral over s, again assuming the same sort of assumptions as we required in the two-dimension case regarding non-vanishing of a Jacobian and that the map is one-to-one, -one, etc. Specifically, we can write any sort of transformation t as something which takes u, v, and w to some functions g of u, v, w, h of u, v, w, and k of u, v, w. We could rewrite this by saying that t is the transformation which sends x to g of u v w, or sends u v w to g of u v w. It sets y equal to h of u v w, and z equal to k of u v w. The associated Jacobian is defined in a way that's very similar to what it was before. It's the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives, but in this case, instead of a 2 by 2 matrix, we're going to have a 3 by 3 matrix. The first row is going to be the partial derivatives of g with respect to u, v, and w, respectively. The second row is going to be the partial derivatives of h with respect to u, v, and w. And the third row is going to be the partial derivatives of k with respect to u, v, and w. And then in this case, we can write that a triple integral over r of some function of x, y, and z dv will be equal to the triple integral over s of f of g of u, v, w, h of u, v, w, k 
okay of UVW. Times the Jacobian of UVW. DU, DV, DW. This, in particular, generalizes some transformations that we were thinking about before. For example, the change of variable from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates, or from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates. As a specific example, let's think about that transformation going from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates. In that transformation, x was equal to rho times sine of phi times cosine of theta, y was equal to rho times sine of phi times sine of theta, and z was equal to rho times cosine of theta. So this is my transformation t. And I want to figure out what the Jacobian is in this case. So the Jacobian here is a function of my u, v, w, but in this case my u, v, and w are played by rho, theta, and phi respectively. And it should be the determinant of the associated 3 by 3 matrix, where in the first entry here, I'm going to put the partial derivative of x with respect to rho, which is going to be sine of phi times cosine of theta. Following this, I put the partial derivative of x with respect to theta, which is going to be minus rho times sine of phi times sine of theta. And then I follow this up with the partial derivative of x with respect to uh, phi, which is going to be rho times cosine of phi times cosine of theta. My other two rows are filled in similarly, and this fills in my 3 by 3 matrix. To calculate out what this determinant is, it makes sense to do a column expansion along the bottom, giving us this expression. And if I remember that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, I can simplify this to cosine of phi times minus rho squared times sine of phi cosine of phi minus rho squared times sine of phi cubed. And I can simplify this further because sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And I can write this as minus rho squared and sine of phi. So what we just talked about then says that if I'm integrating over some region in the xyz plane, I can rewrite this as an integral over some other region in spherical coordinates of the function where I've replaced all the x, y, and z values with their corresponding values in terms of spherical coordinates times the absolute value of the Jacobian, which is going to be rho squared sine of phi, d rho, d theta, d phi. And this was exactly what we used back in the spherical coordinate section a long time ago. And this reminds me that I did have one particular problem with the expression I gave above. In this expression, where I'm writing an integral in the xyz plane, into an integral in terms of the UVW plane, it's not times the Jacobian, it's actually times the absolute value of the Jacobian. Absolute value of the Jacobian here. So sorry about that, that tiny error there. It's really important that we keep the Jacobian positive when we're doing this integral because it's comparing two different volumes, or in the two-dimensional case, two different areas, and these things are positive. But that's probably a pretty good place to stop for today, and I will see you guys next time.